Stephen mentioned the teacher of those children in that video is here with us this, this evening. Uh, Jared Clark, um, you may know him, he goes by a, a number of different titles. He's the teacher at Lakeview School, he's a biologist, up until recently the prairie naturalist, um, he is a dad, and um, I think an, a farmer, uh, has, he and his family have a farm near Edenwald, Saskatchewan, and um, he's going to come and tell you about his experience and um, his work in the classroom. If you could welcome Jared Clark. Thank you, Marla. Good evening, everybody. I'm happy to be here today to talk about climate change and what it means for our province, our economy, and our future. As Carla said, I wear a lot of hats. She actually took the beginning part of my speech, but I'll repeat it anyways this morning. <laughs> I'm a teacher, I'm a scientist, a small-scale farmer, and a father. And I find myself worrying about climate change regardless of which hat I'm wearing. I live on a farm outside of Edenwald with my wife and twins, who are six now. And as a member of that community, I am also concerned about how we deal with climate change while also honoring the jobs of hardworking Saskatchewan people and our provincial economy. It is a fine balance. Now, I love living on the farm and being part of the agricultural fabric of this province. My family uh, raises, or has been raising goats for about 10 years now. And as anyone in the country knows, it can be tough. But boy, I can't tell you, or I can tell you that my family wouldn't want to be anywhere else. But the last little while, it's been really dry around my place and a lot of other parts in southern Saskatchewan. And I mean really dry. Yes, we've had droughts before, but we just had the driest 15-month period on record in 130 years. And if you think about it, that includes the dirty 30s. Now, I looked online at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's drought monitoring page the other day, and sure enough, stretching from Regina to Saskatoon, we are still in a severe drought as of the last assessment on December 31st, 2018. If this persists, I'm worried about where my family is going to get our drinking water from in the future. I'm worried if my pastures and hay fields will grow, and so I'll be able to feed my animals. And I know many other people in this province are equally as worried as I am. But you know, it's when I wear my hat as a teacher and as a father that I'm most worried about the climate crisis. What will the future hold for my children, for my grandchildren, for my students, for your children, or your grandchildren? Now we can pretend that climate change is a hoax, or you can argue that climate change has, or the climate has changed in the past. So we have nothing to worry about today. And I gotta push back on that thought a little bit here. How do we know what the climate was like in the past? Climate scientists. And who is the most concerned about the crisis we face today? Those same climate scientists. We can look to the Arctic where we've seen a 40% decrease in the sea ice since the 1970s. We can look to coastal cities like Miami where sea levels are rising and flooding streets regularly during high tides. In fact, the city of Miami spends millions of dollars annually to raise the roads and install submersible pumps that run 24-7, pumping water back into the ocean. We can look at unprecedented fires in California, northern Saskatchewan, destructive hurricanes in the Philippines and the United States, record-breaking floods and droughts across the globe. We can look to insurance and reinsurance companies like Munich Re, their data clearly shows extreme weather events related to climate have increased three times since the 1980s. Three times. Or we can look at the Great Barrier Reef and see that in three years, half of it has died because of coral bleaching by warmer ocean temperatures from climate change. Yes, half. And I could go on and on and on. It's all right there in front of us. And now, with all this information, picture me standing in front of my class of grade six, seven students. Like many teachers, I wonder, what am I supposed to tell them? And of course, the answer is the verified truth. And so I do. 
But you know, I don't teach them in a way that scares them. I don't shy away from the realities that we're facing, but I teach them that there is hope. Because we have everything we need today to solve the climate crisis. As you just saw in the video, the solar generation, we have great potential in this province to be leaders in renewable energy. When my class visited Cowess's First Nations re renewable energy facility on the edge of Regina, they saw what we can do. That wind solar battery facility is part of the future of clean renewable energy production, the first of its kind in Canada, and it's being led by Cowess's First Nation. But it's not just yeah, we should use it as possible. But it's not just renewable energy that's the solution. There are many other things that we can and must do, from passive house technology to electric car use, to rethinking how we move around in our cities, to protecting native prairie grasslands and forests that sequester carbon, but also regulating heavy emitters and fugitive gas release. Now, I'm so grateful for my friend Stephen Hall, who, who produced this documentary with my class. He raised up their voices when it comes to calling for climate action. He gave them a platform to share. Now, that video has been viewed over 27,000 times. And I make sure that my students understand their voices matter. Because it is their future that is at risk. Now at this point, some of you are probably saying, Jared, that's great, you know, we know about the coral reefs, we know that the Arctic is changing, but it's not affecting us here in Saskatchewan. Or is it? The question is, what will this look like for Saskatchewan in the future? Well, according to the Prairie Climate Center in Winnipeg, if we don't invest in a cleaner, healthier economy now, it will mean warmer winters, which we're already seeing. And I'll admit that on a day like tonight, <laughs> doesn't sound like a bad thing. But when you understand that warmer winters, because of warmer winters, we will expect to see black leg ticks arrive in this province within the next decade. And with it, they will bring Lyme disease like we have never experienced before. And if you don't believe me, you can look at Manitoba where they already have arrived and they weren't before. We can expect more summer days filled with smoke from forest fires in the north, and the health concerns that come with it, especially for children and seniors. We can expect more drought as 30 plus degree days increase from an average of 16 days per summer over the last three decades to about 50 days per summer in the next 30 to 40 years. We can expect extreme weather events putting more pressure on farmers and other industries and putting pressure on government budgets that must respond and react to these events, perhaps without adequate resources. Unless, of course, we find another way. So what can we do? Well, here in Saskatchewan, I think we should acknowledge and thank the people who have helped build this province and helped us prosper. Those who have powered it, like folks down in Esteban and Cornet. We should be grateful for what they have accomplished on our behalf. And then, we need to talk about what climate change will mean for us as a people and as a province. From there, we need to demand from our, or demand leadership from our provincial government. We need a government that puts forth a vision and a framework to help hardworking people in this province transition to a cleaner, healthier economy and make sure that Saskatchewan not only does its part, but also stays strong. Because we have such great potential already right here. Now, I have heard our former Premier talking recently about how Canada's emissions at 1.6% is so insignificant that there is no reason why we need to be part of the solution. But I want you to think about this. There are 195 countries in the world except for three or four, almost every nation on this planet can make that same claim. So either every country in the world does their part to reduce emissions, or we collectively look at our children or look our children in the eyes and tell them that their future doesn't count. Thank you.
thank you.